Now, last week we talked about the importance of the Lord, um, uh, the Word of God, the Father, the Mother, uh, and the father and the mother working together as parents and rearing children. Satan, um, and, and again, I try to always look at the big picture. We do, ne- we do not see the big picture. Uh, when, you, when you're counseling with couples, uh, I often say, uh, you're not each other's enemies. Don't forget who the enemy is. Satan is the enemy. He will do anything to get a wedge in there. And here's another thing I think about is this. You have a cog and a wheel, and the parents are really the cog. The children are the spokes. If he can't get through the parents, he will work on the children. Because if the parents get a broken heart, if they get to the children and the parents get a broken heart, they'll quit serving the Lord. I I have a message I teach on the prodigal. um, um, And uh, uh, that's what he does. Satan um, is very wise. He goes after the weakest link. Uh, uh, in the family, and, uh, and he, he wants to destroy the strongest link in the family. But if he can't get the strongest link, he will work, work on the weakest to get to the strongest. And so, um, uh, so we say, today I want to teach some Bible principles to help us rear godly children um, as well as children, because I think they intertwine to a great degree. To rear godly children, we must love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then we need to teach them to do likewise. So I want to give you a couple of things. I, I come up with, every time I come up with a message, I can think of how do, you, how, how, how do you do that? How do you love God with all your heart, your mind? So I got about five different ways, and none of these ways are uh, for the children part of it. I'm thinking, I, mean, I don't have time to go into that. But I want, I want to look at Mark 12, 30. And uh, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, And there's another verse that says, with all thy strength. That verse says that. How? By allowing the Lord to have first place in our lives, and then letting the children know that you do love the Lord more than them. They need to understand that. And here's what we do. We end up loving them more than we love him, than we do what they want us to do, and not what he wants us to do. Uh, God taught me a lesson when I first came to this church on staff and I may have told you this last time we were together, but I think it's worth repeating. I, I, after the first year of being with the Young at Hearts, I was ready to quit. I was a failure. I mean, I just, I just couldn't please them. And no matter what I did, I tried to please each and every one of them. Went to Doc says, Doc, I don't think this is for me. He says, why, Jack? He says, I can't please them. He says, don't. Please him. That's the bottom line. If he's first place in your life, he has to be number one. You have to please him. And sometimes that's not going to please the children. And let me say this. At a younger age, they say things differently than they do when they get older. Uh, uh, they may uh, give you a hard time while you're rearing them. But when they get older and, and see uh, how um, uh, they've turned out, and, and um, uh, uh, then they appreciate you more because they become parents. And they realize um, uh, what you taught them was right. Uh, Colossians 1.18 um, uh, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things that he might have preeminence. He might have first place. Now, how else? By surrounding our lives, uh, surrendering our lives to the Lord and teaching the teens to follow. Uh, the Bible talks about in Romans 12, and we know it very well. Uh, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may uh, uh, prove what is the good and acceptable will of the Lord. I believe every person, every Christian that loves the Lord and has first place, you ought to give your life to him. Doesn't mean you're going into the ministry. Doesn't mean you're going to be a preacher. Doesn't mean you're going to be a preacher's wife or a missionary. It just means that, uh, 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 and here's the way I looked at it when I first got saved, because I never thought God could ever use me in the ministry. I looked at it this way, Lord, I'm not much but I'm yours. And that's the way I look at it today. Surrender your lives. And I always thought, you know, you need to do it um, publicly one time. And I did when I first got saved. In fact, I, I surrendered every one of my children to the Lord. I knew I couldn't rear them right. I knew it's impossible without his help. 
And so um, I surrendered my life to the Lord, and God had to use a preacher and a message to do that. And I think I told you about that guy, Walter Mayer, who had, could, uh, who had cerebral palsy, and he talked like, uh, uh. I remember that guy preaching that. I, I'll never forget that. I was sitting in my front row, and, and God broke my heart. I said, you can use that guy. I guess you can use me. So surrender your life to the Lord. But then another preacher, uh, it's funny how preaching works. Um, another preacher came and he preached that we need to surrender our lives daily, and we do. I think you need to give your lives once to the Lord, surrender your life once to the Lord, but you need to really surrender every day. By, Paul said, I die daily because this flesh and this heart is deceitfully wicked. And this flesh, in this flesh dwells no good things. Now, why am I keep saying, you know, I, I thought I was going to learn about teenagers, and you just keep talking about me. Let me tell you something. If you're not right, your kids aren't going to be right. You can fool everybody else in the church, but you're not going to fool them. They know you better next to the Lord than anybody does. They know if you're being hypocritical. And so we need to surrender our lives to the Lord. How else uh, can we, the Lord have first place? By realizing that everything we have belongs to God. Do you realize that? Everything you have belongs to God. Again, another familiar verse. What, know you not that your bodily is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. You're bought with a price. This doesn't belong to me. My children do not belong to me. They belong to him. He owns every. He owns the cattle. He owns the air we breathe. I'm one heartbeat away from death. And if you're going to put him first place, you've got to realize everything belongs to him. It's not yours. And I thought of this, this as a young Christian, that I was only going to have my children for 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. Then, then they're going to go away. And they're not mine. They're his. You give them to him. And realize everything you have belongs to God. You would never have uh, divorce if you, uh, uh, that often. And there are circumstances that, that, are, that, that are hard to, uh, to prevent, and it does happen. But, but it would be not as much as if you realize that uh, this belongs to God. You'd be faithful to your mate if you realize this belongs to God. It's not mine. And then teach your children the same way. I'm a firm believer that if you don't live by example, your children, you're going to have a hard time uh, rearing godly children. Um, setting the right kind of example. Now, uh, now here's the thing. Um, uh, by trying, number D, to win the teen's hearts or, or helping them to give their hearts to Jesus. And I said, try to win them. Here's the thing. When they're younger, you have a better shot at win, uh, getting their hearts. Uh, and I gave you a verse. Uh, my son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Uh, by example, that's one great way of winning your children's hearts. But, but what happens when you get saved when you're, uh, and your kids are teenagers? You get saved later in life. Your kids are teens. It's hard. It's hard. They're set, you're set a little bit. You've got to be changing. You've got to be growing. And, 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 and you may not have your kids' hearts. Then you've got to get on your knees and ask God to get their heart. They cannot turn out right without the Lord having their heart. And by the way, you, uh, if, if God has their heart, you have their heart. But, uh, and if you can get their heart, you can get them to give their hearts to the Lord through salvation, uh, through surrender, and through living for the Lord. Um, um, so um, try to win their hearts. Loving the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength will help us control our deceitful and wicked hearts. Let me say this. this I, I had a burn for this at a young age. Dad, try to convince your family that you're a man of God. And I used to say, even though you, you don't feel you are, I don't feel I'm uh, what I need to be. But convince them you're a man of God. How can we do that? By getting your prayers answered. By loving this book. Um, by winning souls. If you want to convince your children, and, and by the way, a man's in the home, the father in the home is so, so important. He's supposed to be the leader. And you ought to convince your children you're a man of God. How do you do that? By getting your prayers answered, fellas. I'd get on my knees by the, with, uh, and talk to the Lord and say, God, I've got to show them I'm a, I'm a, uh, I love you, that, that I know you. And no, no better way to do that than get prayers answered. We, we all the time had a prayer list, and God was, especially when you go into ministry, um, uh, we had a prayer list, and God was constantly uh, answering my prayers. I, I'm not a kind of person who believes, oh, God is so impersonal. I don't want to bother him. God isn't that way. You shouldn't be that way as parents. Your children need something. If it's good and godly and wholesome, you, you ought to want to give it to them. And that's the same thing with God. I pray for everything, everything. Thousands and thousands of prayers from, from um, health to, to um, uh, um, uh, 
cars, houses, big things, little things. Um, oh, and and I, I like that my children to see that God does hear me. He does answer my prayers. And I think that's important in rearing teenagers. Um, teens need to uh, have um, a godly love for others. A godly love is built upon willful giving. It's simple. And there's so many definitions you can come up with a, what a godly love is. But I like using two verses. The one is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. A godly love is built on giving, but one other ingredient with it. How did he give us Jesus? Did he give us Jesus because he had to or because he wanted to? He wanted to. And it says there in Isaiah, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. So a godly love is built upon willful giving. Now you can give without loving. But you won't love without giving. That's how you build. Yeah, I've, I've done this. You ever have somebody get on your nerves and you have a hard time loving? And I give. Now, a lot of times you give, you don't let them know who it is. And by the way, love can be one-sided. You'll learn that with your children especially. God's love for us many times is one-sided. We don't love him the way he loves us. And the same thing with our children. Um, uh, our children don't love us the way we love them because we give more for them. We give, them, we give willingly. So teach them how to, um, to, to love in a godly way. Um, yet it pleased the Lord to, to bruise him. Uh, you will always, uh, and let me say this. You need to teach them this, especially as teenagers. The world's definition of love and God's definition of love are different as far as how it's projected. Our kids today, especially if you reared them in a good home or tried to rear them in a good home, they want your acceptance. Even if they're rebellious, even if they're back, they still want your acceptance to some degree. Accepting their lifestyle, accepting the things they're doing. You had to make it perfectly clear. A godly love isn't based on uh, loving their lifestyle. You love them. You don't love their ungodly lifestyle. I don't love my ungodly lifestyle. Um, and, and so a godly love is built upon willful giving, but it's also built upon loving a, a person, but not loving their lifestyle. Um, um, and uh, I, I told my children at a young age that, you know, no matter what you ever do uh, or where you ever go, I'll always love you. I'll always be your dad. I'll always love you. But don't ask me to accept your ungodly lifestyle. I'll never do that. Um, um, and that's what they want us to do many times. Uh, let's go on now. Let's see. T uh, teach your te teens to be honest by setting the right kind of example. Um, let me ask you this. Are you honest with your tithes and your offerings? Are you honest paying your taxes? Honesty. They're not going to be. Um, why? They said they'll never know. Yes, they will. God knows. And what does the Bible say? We reap what we what? Sure. So if you're not honest, whether they know it or not, uh, uh, they, uh, they won't be honest. Uh, you reap what you sow. Uh, so uh, tithes, offerings, paying taxes, doing a good day's work, uh, all part of being honest. Teach your teens how to work. Uh, teach them how to work hard and that they uh, don't get something for nothing. We as parents have a tendency to give our kids too much. We really do. Or give them things that they, don't, they haven't, I don't want to say earned or deserved, um, but I'll try to illustrate this, uh, w what I'm talking about. Um, um, whatsoever thy hand findeth, do it. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, where, whither thou goest. Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure or whether it be right. For ever, for ever, uh, for even when uh, we were with you, this we commanded you that if a man, uh, if any would not work, neither should. He eat. You need to teach your kids how to work. Uh, the Bible talks about a sluggard. You know, somebody is lazy. Um, uh, teach them how to work. Um, teach them they will reap what they sow, especially uh, the work they do for the Lord. And that's another thing is, 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 is working hard, but doing some things for the Lord. Working for the Lord. Um, this talks about laying your foundation on Jesus Christ. Um, uh, look at uh, 1558. Uh, Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, be uh, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Uh, for as uh, you know that your labor is not in vain. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me uh, to give every man according to his works. I, I, in the Bible doctors class, the one thing I stress, I try to separate uh, going to heaven from works. Because a lot of them don't understand that. 
going to heaven is just strictly based upon Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with your works. But our works as a Christian are so, so important. Uh, our kids expect something for nothing today. Uh, teach your teens uh, to use their talents for the Lord. Uh, Matthew 25 is an uh, awesome parable on the talents. He gave one, one five, one two, and one one talent. The five received five. The two received two. And you check God, uh, the Lord, the master. The, the master is a picture of the God, and uh, uh, the servants are a picture of the, uh, God's children. And when he returns, he gives an answer. Uh, they answer to their master, the one that had five got five. The one that had two talents got two back. He didn't get five. Why? Because he wasn't a five-talent Christian. He was only a two-talent Christian. But you look at how the master rewarded him. He said the same thing for both. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful for a few things. I will make thee rule over many, and thou in the joy of the Lord. He said the same thing for the other one. But what did he say to the one that had the one? What did the one do? He had one talent. What did he do? Did he, did he invest it? All he did was hit it. He hid his master's talent. He said, thou wicked and slothful servant. And, and by the way, let me say about talents. I believe talents, uh, there it's, uh, um, uh, biblically speaking, in context, it's talking about money. But a talent can be your abilities. Um, and uh, um, I really believe we have talents in many areas of our lives. I think of your dad. He is awesome. He can do anything with his hands. Um, uh, I can't. I can tear things up. For when it comes to making things, one talent. Uh, when it comes to singing, probably three. When it comes to people, I really think I'm, I'm a four or five talent person. So we have talents in a lot of areas of our lives. Find the, the, the talents that your children have, and especially what they can do for the Lord. Um, we, we had our children playing piano and uh, Gabriel playing a trumpet, and, and, uh, um, and it's hard, especially getting through those teenage years. But once God starts using them, it, uh, 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 Sarah, I think she has 22 or 25 students that she teaches, and she's working on a harp, and she's got her three kids playing. I just heard she's got her three kids playing guitar now, you know, and stuff like that. But using her talents for the Lord, uh, labor, uh, H, uh, teach them to respect their elders by using... Uh, proper uh, uh, address and response. I think this is important. You ought to teach them how to, how to, to address people, uh, not by their first names, but by using their titles, Mr. and Mrs., Pastor, Brother, Sister, Yes, Ma'am, No, Ma'am, Yes, Sir, No, Sir. And you know what the greatest way to do that is? Say, Yes, Ma'am, No, Sir, Yes, Ma'am, No, Ma'am. Uh, um, um, I always, what I do a lot is say brothers and sisters. If I know the person's a Christian, I call them my brother, call them my sister. Um, uh, and because I feel like we're part of a family, we're part of a spiritual family. Um, when rearing your ch uh, children, especially teens, you must learn to balance your life by establishing some godly priorities. And I, I, I really didn't have a way of doing this. I think we make a mistake of establishing our priorities this way. The Lord, family, church, work, children, exercise, you know, you have your priorities. Why? Because if we do this, we have a tendency to think, well, the family's, um, well, uh, more important than church. If you put the church up here, church is more important than work, and work is more important than children, and children's more important than exercise. I think you're better off doing it this way. The Lord is first, then you have your priorities here. Now, let me tell you, uh, yes, it's important to go to church, but, but if I got a date with my wife, guess what? That's a priority. You've got to date with your children. That's a priority. If you put your priorities here, uh, the key to, to um, 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 uh, establishing godly priorities is, is um, uh, scheduling your time, balancing your life, and balancing your children's life. You get so busy. The older they get, the busier you get. And, uh, and you've got to balance things out. How do you do that? Well, have your priorities going this way. And if you have a schedule, if you live by a schedule, which I do, um, uh, you live by a schedule, then this is the time and this is the most important thing that I'm going to do right now. Uh, and that's, you work your priorities this way instead of going this way. Then you're going to think, wow. Uh, you know. And if you work your schedules right, you'll still do all your church activities. You'll still have them doing that, but you have to have a schedule to do that. Uh, let's see, what do we have next? Um, teach your children the proper value of money. I think we, we really uh, are weak in this area sometimes. Teach them how to handle their money, to tithe, to live by a budget. And I often say this, and I taught my children, buying now, pay later is a devil's lie. Satan 
destroys us, destroys families because of finances. I'm so glad we have Brother Ron uh, teaching on finances. We become slaves to whom we owe money. The rich ruleth over the poor, and a borrower is a servant to the lender. Um, a preacher that counsels a lot, uh, you find basically five reasons, you know, if, if you're having marital problems, uh, five reasons um, uh, for divorce, that they're wanting to get a divorce. And usually it's a combination of them all. Always violating Bible principles. Always violating Bible principles. Uh, unfaithfulness, infidelity. Improper communication. I used to say lack of communication. But it's really improper in communication because they can be screaming and yelling at each other. It may not be a lack. It may be improper. Uh, In-laws can. But I think number two next to violating Bible principles is finances. Finances. Um, children need a mom. And uh, my wife, because being in the ministry, she's always worked, but she's always worked part-time with a schedule around what we do. She works at American Greetings. I never let her go full-time. Why? Because I needed her. You know, in certain times, I want her to be able to tell them no. And so uh, uh, priorities. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, money is not as uh, valuable as our time. Um, when you give somebody your time, you give them your life. So um, uh, money is important, uh, but it's not as important as our life. Uh, re uh, reward your teens properly. Think about this. Reward your team properly. Your kids, c they mow the lawn, and you give them uh, $20 for 15 minutes of work. You know what you've done? You've paid them $80 an hour. You don't make that. Um, you give a kid a dollar today, and they look at you, and they think you're nuts. You know, when I used to take my kids, and they'd sing, and Mrs. Schiffer would give them a buck. You know, they were thrilled to death. You teach them the value of money. Um, um, do not give them something for nothing, um, for doing nothing, unless it's a special occasion, of course, a birthday or whatever. But you give them something for nothing, um, um, this is how we create this welfare mentality or you owe me mentality. Teach them how to work. Work for what they get. Um, 2 Thessalonians 3.10, for even when uh, we were with you, this we command you that if any would not work, neither should they eat. Be careful about overspending. I find this, you know, uh, um, uh, paying for the graduation, paying for college, paying for a wedding. Because I was on a fixed income, um, I, I prayed about it, and I gave them X amount of dollars for the graduation. And I, I told them, now, you can spend every penny of this on, on getting pictures for your graduation or getting you a jacket. Or, or you can, I gave them suggestions of how they could spend it. I had a lady I went to the Lord that took their pictures for the graduation. Very, very reasonable. Uh, same thing for a wedding. We gave them X amount of dollars for their wedding. And I said, now, listen, this is what mom and dad will do. And this is what you've got to do with this amount of money. And my, my daughter, we had a friend that uh, we had it, uh, in Pennsylvania. She, she made her a beautiful wedding gown for a, for a present. And uh, uh, I, I think you spend 10, 20, 30, you go into debt. You go into debt for the wedding. Or, or the, they want everything and they go into debt. I tell them, save it for the honeymoon. Save it for a house. Uh, but um, uh, then college, paying for college. Uh, and I, and God bless you if, you if you can put your kids through college. But I'm going to tell you something. The more you give your children something for nothing, the less they appreciate it. They really do. And, and I'm not against you doing that, uh, but we couldn't afford it. And uh, you, uh, I, I said, now listen, kids, this is what we're going to do. You're going to work during the summers. You're going to save money. So when you go to college, you're not going to college until you have an X amount of dollars in the bank. And then I said, I promise me, you do what I tell They wanted to, well, my two girls wanted to marry preachers. And I said, well, if you're going to marry preachers, you're going into ministry. That rascal, if he's honest, he's not going to make much. And I said, uh, uh, you're going to uh, uh, um, uh, have this amount of money going in. And if you'll do what I tell you to do, you'll, uh, the goal is to graduate debt free. And they did. Both, both girls did. And so um, um, uh, here's the next thing. Uh, teach them to judge righteously. You know, people like to fill this up and say, judge not that you not be judged. Uh, folks, we judge every day. We judge a hundred time, times a day, scores of times a day. Judges simply making decisions what to do. 
Don't let him pull that card on you. Judge not that you not be judged. Um, uh, we have to judge. Judge not according, according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. We've got to judge righteously. Here's what it's saying in this verse. Judge not that you not be judged. It's talking about, first of all, number one, um, uh, when you judge and you have to judge, you will reap what you sow. So if you're not judging well, you're, you're going to have some problems. But, but it, it talks about judging righteous judgment. Judge according to this book, not your opinion. So you, we have to judge. We have to judge righteous judgment. Noah Webster, 1828 Dictionary, to compare facts, ideas, and uh, perceive uh, their agreement or, or disagreement, and uh, thus to distinguish true from falsehood, to discern, to distinguish, to consider uh, accurately for the purpose of forming an uh, opinion or conclusion. Judge not according to the appearance. And uh, we judge all the time. You judge what time you're going to get up in the morning. You ought to judge a lot with your teens. What time they're going to be home. Um, and I'll cover some other things a little bit later. Uh, now, um, judge righteously when it comes to chasing your children. We ought to chasten our children. The Bible teaches us that. You need to judge righteously. Uh, and I put some ideas in the first lesson. Um, let me say this about chastening. Always teach before chastening. Um, the more preventative you are in your teaching, the less corrective you'll have to be. I always try to foresee things. Uh, they call that discernment, uh, spiritual discernment. A lot of times my kids were, you know, I don't know, the Holy Spirit would just tell me they're doing something they shouldn't do. And, and, uh, but anyway, um, uh, uh, judge righteously. It is our duty as a parent to help uh, them make decisions. And here's what the world has taught us. How long do we help our kids make decisions? Until they turn 18. They're an adult. That's not what the Bible says. How long do we help them make their decisions? Uh, until they say, I do. That's when, uh, that's what I told my girls. That's what I told their, their uh, fiancés. Uh, I said, now listen, she's mine until they say, I do. Once, she, once you say, I do, she's yours. And you, can, you know, and I, I won't interfere unless you ask. And uh, listen to what it says. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife. Well, when should that happen? Uh, um, when they say, I do. And they twain shall be one flesh. So, uh, so uh, then they are no more twain but one flesh. So you need to have an influence on their lives. Uh, you need to help them make decisions. Um, help them pick the right kind of mates. Help them pick a godly mate. Teach them never to date someone they can never marry. Why? Because you're going to marry someone that you date. Teach your teens uh, to let you have... This is important. Uh, and I did this with my girls uh, especially. Uh, that, that I did it this way. Uh, I said, you got a choice uh, when it comes to picking a mate. Mom and dad can pick them. You can have veto power. Or... You can pick them, and we can have veto power. Oh, oh, we'll pick them, and you can have veto power. Now, we did this at a younger age, so they were pretty well agreeing with it. But we had that settled before they went to college. And um, I did use my veto power on, on, on Sarah. <laughs> I mean, on Crystal, on Crystal. And you say, why? Because sometimes they don't have the discernment they need. And let me say this. You say, that's awful cruel. No, it isn't. If you love the Lord... And they love the Lord, and you're both seeking the Lord's way. You're going to come up with the same conclusion. And by the way, that puts a heavy weight. When I told her this guy wasn't the one, and she said, Dad, are you sure? I'll tell you about that in just a second, hopefully, maybe. Uh, uh, help them to pick the right kind of friends, the right kind of mate. Teach them. Okay, let's see here. Learn how to say, yes, you will do this, and no, you will not do this to your children. No, they cannot be your friends. No, you cannot go there. Yes, you are going to church. Yes, you will be home on time. Um, um, teach your teens. Teach your teens to say no to their peers. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. What does that mean? Say no. Teach them to say no. You teach them to say it lovingly, but say no. Uh, number four, teach your teens not, you're not in competition with your peers. We live in a highly competitive society today. And I learned a long time ago, you know, I'm not in competition with anybody on our staff. When we first got on staff, my wife says, well, what is so-and-so doing? I said, I don't care what so-and-so is doing. It doesn't make any difference what so-and-so is doing. Uh, every one of us have a race that we're running. And every one of our races are different. 
And the Bible says we're to finish our race looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So while we're running our race, we're not really in competition with it. Now, see, what, what, what do you do when you play sports? Well, what I did, especially when they wanted these old guys to play basketball with these young bucks when they had these staff things, and I, I said, oh, God, help me make, not make a fool of myself. Uh, Lord, help me to get back and forth down this court and help me to, to score, score five points. I told Gabriel when he was younger, I said, son, I said, uh, don't look at it as, you know, it's you, and, and you got to just do it. No, ask the Lord to help you do it. This guy you're guarding scores, uh, he's, he's, their, uh, he's their best player. I'm just being hypothetical, but I did tell him this, because uh, he didn't watch the best player. But this guy averages 18 points a game. Ask the Lord to ho- help you hold him to 10. Uh, you, only, uh, you normally score six points a game. Ask the Lord to help you get 10 points a game. That's how you um, uh, 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 get over this competition thing. Um, I mean, and, and I want to win. I'm a, I, in fact, if you watch me play volleyball or anything, I like to win. But, but I realize that, that competition can really, uh, uh, and the, there's a verse that talks about it's, it's, um, uh, competition leads to, that leads to comparison is carnal. It's worldly. You have to be careful. Um, do the best they can, but do their best for the Lord. When I play disc golf, I play with a lot of these young bucks, uh, 30s and 20s and things like that, and, and I'm just playing to, to beat my last game. I'm playing to do my best. I set a goal and said, Lord, help me. If I beat them, fine. If I don't, that's okay, too. Some of them get upset because I, they don't get upset, but, but uh, they say, how does this guy 68, you know, win this game? You know, but, but I'm not doing it for that reason. I'm just doing my best for the Lord. I basically do it for exercise. Um, teach, uh, uh, let's see, here, number L. Teach and provoke your children to think. Our kids don't know how to think today, Every, but everything that thinks for them. Um, um, and here's what I learned. If I try to tell my son this is the way something is, or my daughters this is the way it is, they don't always believe me. But you provoke their thinking, I think, by asking questions. You get them to ask the question, and you get them to provoke their, th- and you provoke their thinking, and they come with the answer, they believe you. And it's crazy. You ever have them come to you and, and say, uh, you know, you've been telling them this for years, and oh, their friend Joe tells them that, and oh, yeah, you know, Joe told me, I, said, I told you that five years ago. You know, and so, um, but I think we don't provoke people to think. I do this in my Bible doctrines class now. What did the Lord do when somebody asked him a question? Did he always give them an answer? No, he asked them a question. And, and, and when they were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they say, hey, answer this one, I'll answer you. I'm not going to answer that. Well, I'm not either. But I don't mean that to do that with your kids, but provoke their thinking. If they can think, if they can understand it, they can agree with you. If they can come up with the idea, the light bulb goes on, they will agree with you. And so sometimes when you try to cram it down their throats, they just don't get it or they don't want to get it. They're rebellious or whatever. Um, Teach them to make godly decisions by using the word of God. Again, the book of Proverbs, a book of wisdom, a book of knowledge, a book of understanding. And I think I shared this with you last time. I'll just do it quickly because I think it's so important. uh, uh, Knowledge is the gathering of facts. It's what you know. Understanding is how you grasp those facts. Uh, 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 That could be an IQ there, Uh, whatever your IQ is. How well you understand what you know. But wisdom is the ability to apply the knowledge and understanding to your life. It's spiritual common sense. We have kids today with no common sense, uh, or Christians today with no common sense. Oh, yeah, I, they know what the verse says. Be not deceived, God does not mock, what the, that's whatsoever, whatsoever he soweth, that shall he also reap. Okay, under, I know the verse. Uh, what does it mean? Well, if I plant this little corn, it's going to come up a corn. I'm going to reap what I sow, but it's much more than that. Where's the wisdom there? Well, you plant that little corn, it doesn't come up a little corn. Uh, um, uh, you reap what you sow. You want to be loved. You need to sow love. Uh, and there's so many principles, wisdom to be able to apply this book to your life. That's what wisdom is. Under, uh, knowing it is one thing. Understanding what you're reading, you can read the verse, you understand what it says. But applying it to your life, that's what you've got to get your children to do is uh, learn how to apply the word of God to their life. Um, let's see here. Build good memories that will last a lifetime. The memory of the just is blessed. We always had special birthdays, 
uh, holidays and vacations. We always did a, made a big deal out of them. Gabriel loved playing sports, and so we'd get a bunch of his buddies together, and they play football every year. That was one of the things they would do. Um, uh, holidays and vacations. I loved, I was in the military. I was overseas. Uh, I come back, and, and I re, re, I've, I've seen 19 countries. And I realized how wonderful our country is. And I wanted to see a country with our children. We had a goal four years before, before our years kids graduated, three years before they graduated. No, four, four years before they graduated. We took two weeks, two weeks, one week, and one week, four different years, and we saw 48 states. We went across the country. That was just a goal we had, something special, some memories we wanted. Now, since then, my wife and I have seen Alaska and Hawaii together, 25th anniversary and I think 35th or 40th anniversary. Uh, and so build some fond memories, good memories, because there's going to be some bad ones. But when you get older, they will dwell on the good memories. Um, uh, um, let's see, date night with your wife and with your children, family time, make them special. Teach them the importance of having a good name. A good name is rather to be chosen than great witches. When I, before I got saved, I hated my name. I hated Beaver. I really did. I, I met my wife over a telephone. I, I don't have time to go into there. But my name was John Campbell. I hated Jack. I hated Beaver. Leave it to Beaver. Eager Beaver. Bucky. I used to fight because of my name when I was in Wilson Junior High School. I hated that. But, you know, after I got saved, God taught me that that, that was my biological name. And that's what he gave me, uh, allowed me to have, was the name Beaver. And uh, so, um, but, but there's another name that we don't think about. We have a spiritual name. We call it Christian. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Teach your children your name is important. But more important than that is your name as a Christian is important. You carry the name of Christ. You ought to do it well. Uh, try to set some godly standards or rules to help your family stay as far away from sins as possible. I could take the whole session and could have taught you on this. In the weak areas of your life, every one of us have weak areas. Every one of us. And if you're honest with yourself, you ought to write down your weak areas. You set some standards, some rules. That's all a standard is. You can define it differently, but I just define it as a rule. To keep you as far away from sin as possible in the weak areas of your life. Um, uh, you need to set standards in the home. You need to know your children's strengths. You need to know their weaknesses. And I'll give you a, an illustration just real quickly. Uh, a preacher, uh, and, and all preachers that are worth anything, believe that having a physical relationship before marriage is wrong. Uh, uh, but he said, uh, necking and petting before marriage is wrong. Then he said, uh, uh, kissing before marriage is wrong. And then he said, holding hands. That's what he taught his youth. Holding hands before marriage is wrong. He said, oh, man, that's going too far. Wow. Well, the Bible, Paul said this, um, um, uh, to avoid fornication. No, let's see, how does the verse start out? Um, it is not good for a man to touch a woman, but to avoid fornication, let them marry. But, it, when, but anyway, he set these standards. And one Sunday night, these, this couple, deacons' kids, come to him, bawling their eyes out and says, preacher, we messed up. And, and he couldn't get them quit crying. 20 minutes. He said, listen, I don't care what you've done wrong. The Lord can forgive you, but I cannot help you unless you tell me what you've done wrong. And they said, preacher, preacher, we kissed. You know what that preacher said? Glory. Why? Because he had set some standards here. And when they, fell, when they did what they did, they were only here. Godly standards. Um, 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 I almost... As a young preacher, I, I picked up a couple, three girls on, on Tiedemann Road one night. They were hitchhiking. Picked them up, drove them. Uh, they, they just wanted a lift, and they, I thought I'd give them a track, and I did. Uh, drove them down Tiedemann to Hauserman, and they asked me to left, leave them off on the corner. I did. About a month later, I got a phone call, and there was a young girl's voice, and the Holy Spirit told me, didn't audibly, but I knew this was a girl, one of the girls I had picked up. And she started saying, oh, you, you're such a nice guy. And, and I knew who she was. I said, listen. I'm a, I'm a happily married man. Don't you ever call this phone number again. And she didn't, and I thank God for that because it was three against one. I could be in jail today for something stupid like that. So I set up a standard. I cannot be alone with somebody. Uh, I've, I've had shut-in uh, people that go with me. Nellie Langebert, I always, they always look like my mother uh, so I don't get in trouble. I've picked up people in the car, but I've put the kids in the front and, and, and the lady in the back. Why? I don't want to let my good be evil spoken of. 
I want to avoid the appearances of evil. Set standards in your life. You have weak ears. Fellas, you've got problems with pornography? Then break your computer. Do something with it. Ladies, you've uh, you got problems with as the wor- stomach turns or whatever those soap operas are? <laughs> Turn the TV off during that time. I don't know what your weak area But we all have weak areas. And, and you need to have standards, rules, to keep you as far away from those areas as possible. Now, um, I set some standards before my kids went to college, uh, um, more with the girls than with Gabriel, um, 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 because I believe a dad has to protect the daughters um, because they're supposed to be in submission. And they marry somebody, they're supposed to submit to their husbands. Uh, set some godly standards before going to college. Um, one was this. Uh, first time the guy's going to take you on a date in the college is not the same kind of date what we think of. He had to call me. And I don't feel so sorry for these guys. Because they can't say no. Our girls had a hard time saying no. I said, well, here's the way you do it. Just have them call me. And you've got to let me know to tell them yes or no. Because I don't know the guy. You just call me and let me know. They couldn't say no to him. So the guy, ting, 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 ting. Mr. Beaver, uh, can I take your daughter? But that's one of the standards we had. We had another standard uh, that when you graduate... If you haven't found Mr. Wow, that guy you're going to marry, you're coming back home. So why did you do that? Because we wanted to have influence in helping him pick a godly mate. If I sent him, and there's a lot of churches, a lot of Christian schools that would have taken our kids, our girls. But I wanted to be here to help them pick that mate. They both found him in the 12th year, uh, and they were thankful for that. Um, 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 graduate debt free. That was one of our goals. Um, let's see. And the biggest thing was veto power, to have veto power over who they picked for a mate. There, were, there was this guy, really nice guy. Uh, I went to Hiles Anderson College, and my kids ended up going there uh, many, many years after I did. But my oldest daughter, Crystal, she's going in her senior year, this guy liked her, and he knew her when I was in college, and I think they were in the sixth grade together. So he knew she was the one. This guy come and washed my car. I mean, the guy was great. He come to, uh, in the summer to visit for a week or two. I wanted to get to know the guy. So I took him, talked to him and everything else. But you know what he said? He said, Mr. Beaver, uh, 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 I know God wants me to marry your daughter. Um, uh, uh, and if he doesn't marry your daughter, I'm not going into ministry. He shouldn't have said that. You know what that taught me? He loved her or liked her more than he loved him. So when he left, and he was a great guy. Oh, it broke my heart to say that. Uh, and uh, uh, I said, babe, he's not the one. Oh, Dad, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. And, and so, you know, she ended up marrying Albert. She's got nine kids. This guy got married, went into ministry. I think he had three or four kids. And so, folks, try to get them to give, if you have their hearts, uh, try to get them to give you veto power. Um, now, be careful about uh, where you allow your children to work. Uh, does their work uh, cause them to miss church and special activities? Does their work allow them to make worldly friends? Does their work cause them to rebel uh, against you and the things of the Lord? Now, remember, if you set these standards ahead of time and you talk to them ahead of time, they agree with those things. It's a lot easier to, to, to uh, do it that way than to wait till they're in a situation and you have to tell them no. Allow your teens to grow in the Lord as much as your faith will allow them. And I simply mean this. Um, the just shall live by faith. We live by faith. And, and the just shall live by faith. And um, so you, I've learned that you only let you, you give as much freedom to your children as much as you believe and have faith in them that they won't, they'll do what you tell them to do or they'll do what the Lord wants them to do. And that's what happens. The less faith you have in them, the less freedom you're going to give them and probably the most problems you're going to have in a home. Um, and so, um, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, usually, uh, uh, usually your daughters will need more protection than your sons. Uh, to rear godly children, we must have a... And, and please don't take this wrong. A godly fear for the Lord. And teach your children to fear the Lord also. Um, 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 it t- you can read the verses. I don't have time to deal with them now. But we need to fear the Lord will not quit using us. See, we always look at fear as being bad. But if I, fear the, fear, if I don't serve the Lord, I do what he wants me to do, then he'll quit using us or blessing us. We need to fear disappointing or not pleasing the Lord. We need to fear the chastening of the Lord. You need to teach your kids what chastening is. 
I think a lot of them get saved at a young age because the Bible says, suffer the little children to come unto me, forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. But what happens, they hit those teenage years and they start doing something wrong. They don't understand this chastisement, what it really is. That means you're God's children. He's trying to get you the fellowship back. And you don't teach them the chastening of the Lord. They think they're not saved. And again, some of them may not be saved, but, but again, uh, teach them uh, uh, the, fear of the, uh, the fear of the Lord, uh, the fear of the Lord as, um, um, as Christians, uh, if we do not obey his word uh, uh, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we need to fear going to hell if they don't get saved. Uh, fear not him which can kill the body. That's a, a godly fear, a worldly fear. I mean, a worldly fear, a satanic fear, but is not able to uh, kill the soul, but rather fear him. That's a godly fear that is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. A godly fear is a great motivator to control this flesh. I really believe with my studying on fear, you ought to do a word study on fear. You ought to do a Bible study on fear on that topic. You'll find that fear is mentioned about three times as much as loving God. Fearing God is mentioned about three times more. And I really believe the heart is, is, is deceitfully wicked, and I think love is associated with the heart. Um, um, uh, love the Lord with all thy what? Heart, your feelings and emotions are involved in that. But how do you control this flesh? I think a godly fear is a great way to control this flesh. Um, um, it is so hard to control the flesh. Um, and, and I think a, a godly fear will control this flesh better than, than a, a, a godly love. And I think they work together. I don't think you can love the Lord the way you should unless you have a godly fear for him. And you can call it reverence all you want, but you can look at some of these uh, um, uh, Dathan and Korah, uh, uh, Dathan, Koran, and Bi uh, uh, Byram, uh, David and Bathsheba, uh, Samson and Delilah, Ananias and Sapphira, um, Nadab and Abihu. You, you read their lives, especially Ananias and Sapphira. Christians, they went to heaven prematurely. You need to teach them the chastening of the Lord. Um, let's see here. A godly fear is a great motive to help us control the flesh. A godly fear is a healthy fear. We will never love God the way we should unless we learn to have a godly fear for him. Make sure your children are saved and not doubting their salvation. Teach them the doctrine of chastisement. Why do children doubt their salvation? They may not be saved. They may have been dealt with improperly. There may have been no repentance. It may have been a mama, uh, mama wanted me to get saved, and so I went down to, uh, you know, I'm talking about as a young kid. Um, uh, they may be saved, but are backslidden and not living for the Lord. Uh, perhaps they're not keeping their self. And here's a, one great thing I think you should do when they get saved, whether they're young, especially when they're young, tell other people about it and have testimony time. When you have your devotions every five, six months, give your testimony and have them give their testimony. Keep that salvation testimony fresh in their mind. So when they hit those teenage years and they do something wrong, they realize the Lord's just chasing them and they haven't lost their salvation. Pray about everything. Pray without ceasing. The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Closing thoughts. And I want to give you a couple positive things to think about because I'm going to tell you, uh, well, let's look here. When it seems there, uh, when it, there seems to be no hope, just remember the story of the prodigal found in Luke 15. But think about this one. Never forget Perfect children in a perfect environment rebelled against the perfect parent. Who was that? Yeah, Adam and Eve. And, um, um, you know, we, 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 none of us as parents are perfect and are going to not make mistakes. Make the mistake. Uh, I told you in uh, rearing children, go to them, tell them you're sorry. Uh, tell them uh, you were wrong. You're sorry. Will they forgive you? Uh, let them know you're human. Um, and uh, always do things in love. Charity never faileth. 